Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And I trust that you know what that means. And together, God's people say, of course, hallelujah. Well, friends, how are you doing this morning? Are you fighting the flu? Are you battling with some sickness or illness? Do you feel depressed? Do you feel the burden and the weight of this world upon your shoulders? Even in the midst of those trials, of those sufferings, when you think on Jesus, of all that he has done, of all that he is doing in the hearts and the lives of his people throughout the world, bringing new people into the kingdom each and every day. When you think of all that he's going to do when he returns upon this earth and he truly reigns as king of kings and lord of lords physically over the people of this earth, is there a glimmer, a spark in your spirit that reignites your joy in the Lord? I trust that there is, friends, and I hope and I pray that that will be a motivation to you that when you do feel the burdens and the weight, the limitations and the hardships of this world, that you'll cast your mind upon Jesus and you'll rest in the joy of our Lord, of our soon coming King. Hallelujah. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible. And today we're going to pick up halfway through chapter four of Exodus. And we're going to begin in verse 18, where we last left off in verse 17. God has called Moses. Moses has offered many excuses as to why he is not the man that should be put in the position of doing what God is asking Moses to do. And God is eliminating all of those excuses so that Moses is left to do nothing but obey. And that's where we pick up in verse 18. It says, Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said unto his father-in-law, let me go, I pray thee, I ask thee, and return unto my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now I want us to recognize here the honor that Moses gives to his father-in-law. His father-in-law has been caring for him and taking care of him since he left Egypt and began wandering around in the desert. Not only has he taken care of him, but he has given his daughter Zipporah unto Moses and from that relationship, they have borne Jethro a grandson. And so we could truly assume here that if Jethro had not given Moses his blessing to return to Egypt, Moses would not have gone. That's how much he honors his father-in-law. That's how much he honors one who is older than him. Remember, Jethro was a priest of Midian. And so there was some spiritual significance there, some godly significance and Moses honored him for that position that he had, for that relationship that he had with the Lord. But Jethro doesn't say no. Jethro does give him blessing, and he says, go in peace. Now the Lord, in verse 19, said unto Moses in Midian, go, return into Egypt. And notice this, all the men which sought thy life, they are now dead. This is one of the excuses that Moses had before the Lord in not going. And as I stated, the Lord is eliminating these excuses one by one. Moses used the excuse of not being able to speak eloquently. And so God has chosen Aaron to speak on behalf of Moses, who will speak on behalf of God. So God's eliminating all of Moses' excuses so that Moses is only left to obey God. Well, Moses took his wife and his sons, he sat upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Now the Lord said unto Moses, when you return into Egypt, 
See that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh. Throw the rod down. Allow it to turn into a serpent. Take it back up and it will become a rod again. Put your hand in your bosom. Show the leprosy. Put your hand in your bosom. Show the miraculous healing. And take water from the Nile River. Pour it upon the land and watch it become blood. But he says, as you do these things, Moses, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, we, of course, know that the reason God is going to do this is because he is going to teach Egypt a very significant lesson. And we have to remember, even though Egypt is a pagan nation, all bloodlines lead back to Adam. And so as we look forward from Adam and we see these pagan nations, we see these false religions, we know they know, we know they have heard, they have been taught of the living God, Yahweh, but they have chosen to do things their way rather than Yahweh's way. And so God is basically saying, I want to remind the people, I want to bring back their memory that I am the living and true God. And all that they are doing is vain and vanity. And he says in verse 22, you will say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son. These are my people, my firstborn. These are my chosen ones. Now I am telling you to let my son go, that he may go and serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your son, Pharaoh, even your firstborn. So the warning has been given here. And we know upon the 10th plague that God is going to set upon Egypt, that this will become a reality in Pharaoh's courts, in his house, in his life. But God is going to harden the heart of Pharaoh through the first nine plagues so that the 10th plague will take place because God has said right here, if you do not let my people go, I will slay your son, your firstborn. Now the Lord says to Aaron in verse 27, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the Mount of God. And he kissed Aaron. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Because remember, Aaron is going to speak on behalf of God, but Aaron is going to take his words from Moses. Aaron is never going to hear from God personally. He's going to have to trust that what Moses says truly comes from the Most High. Now, after being briefed by Moses, in verse 29, Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron told them all the words which the Lord has spoken unto Moses. And he did these miraculous signs in the sight of the people. And the people seeing these signs, they believed. And when they realized that God had heard their prayers, God had come to deliver them. They bowed their heads and they worshiped. Well, after spending time with the elders, Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh. And they said unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now notice, when God originally tells Moses to tell Pharaoh to let the people go, it's only for a brief three-day journey into the wilderness, and then they will return. But ultimately, they're going to be told to go and never to return. Well, Pharaoh says in verse 2, Who is the Lord? Why should I obey him? Why should I let Israel go? These people are performing a great service to us as Egyptians. They're building our cities for us. They're doing work that without them, we would have to do. I'm not going to let them go. And I do not know your Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said unto Pharaoh, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. And so Pharaoh thinking to himself, if the people have time to murmur, if the people have time to complain, let's increase their tasks. And in verse six, Pharaoh commanded the same day 
the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying that you will no more give the people straw to make brick as you did before. Let them now go and gather straw for themselves, for they have too much time on their hands. Therefore they cry unto their God, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. So in verse 9, Let more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein. And so the taskmasters, they followed the orders of Pharaoh. They tell the people that they now have to gather their own straw. And in verse 12, it says, The people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt, seeking and gathering stubble instead of straw. They're spread all across the land. They're trying to fulfill their daily quotas and yet take on this extra work in doing so. And because they were not used to this extra work, their quota seemed to fall off. And in verse 14, it says, because of this, they were beaten. And they were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? And the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, why are you dealing with us this way? You expect the same quota from us, but you're not supplying the ingredients in order for us to make brick. You expect us to make the same amount of brick and find all the ingredients necessary to make the brick. And Pharaoh said in verse 17, I'm doing this because you are idle. You have too much time to pray to your God and you have too much time on your hands for pleading unto me to allow you to go into the wilderness and make sacrifice. So my word is law. No straw will be given to you. You will find it on your own, and you are yet expected to fulfill your daily quotas. Well, the people having gone to Pharaoh now decide to go to Moses and Aaron in verse 20. And they said unto Moses and Aaron, the Lord look upon you. The Lord judge you because you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. In other words, you said that you've come to deliver us, but you've actually made our lives harder. And so Moses, hearing the people, returns unto the Lord and says, Lord, why have you done so? Why are you treating the people with such hardship? And if this is what is going to take place, why have you even sent me? If you're going to harden Pharaoh's heart, why have you sent me? For from the moment that I came unto Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he's only done evil to the people. And there has been no deliverance. And our position as his people, as his servants, is simply to wait patiently upon him, not to question him. And so the Lord said unto Moses, now you're going to see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. Because I am the Lord, my word is true. Just as I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, by the name of Jehovah was I not known to them. But unto you, Moses, I have presented myself as Jehovah. They did not know me as Jehovah. In other words, God is saying, I am going to be more personal in the relationship that I had with you, even more personal than that of your forefathers. I have established my covenant with them, and I will give them the land of Canaan. I know that they are suffering. I know that they are slaves unto Egypt. I will deliver you from this bondage. And in verse seven, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a personal God. And you will know, each of you will know that I am the Lord your God. Well, Moses tells the people of all that God has said, but because of the labor that they are under, because of their anguish of spirit in verse 9 and the cruel bondage, they were unable to find any joy in what he had said. Well, after a summary of all that has already been said in chapter 7, verse 5, God says unto Moses, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord after you are delivered, after they send you out of Egypt. 
And this is important as you're going to see because the Egyptians had many gods which they served. And God wants to prove to the Egyptians that he is the true and living God. And if there is any godship to the gods that they serve, their gods even bow down to Jehovah the Most High. And don't think just because their gods are false gods that they are limited in power or works because being false gods, they receive their power from the dark side, from the evil one, from Lucifer. And as we will see through the magicians of Egypt that do some of the same miracles that Moses himself does, we will learn that there is great power even among the kingdom of darkness. But that power is no match for that of the Almighty. And so God is going to prove to the Egyptians that he is the Almighty. And he says, I'll do this in verse 5 of chapter 7. When I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt, and I bring out the children from among them. And that's where we're going to end today, friends. The next time together, we'll pick up in verse 8 of chapter 7. The lesson that we can learn today, I think, is that, again, we simply need to trust that God's plan is in action. And everything... Everything to the smallest detail that is happening in the world that we live in, the world around us, all is taking us one step closer to the final culmination of God's ultimate plan, to the return of his son, Jesus Christ, who will reign physically upon this world in which we live. And so what we, his people, are to be doing while we are here is preparing ourselves for faithfulness, obedience, and acts of servants so that our transition into the next world will be as simple and as easy as possible. There won't be a great change from this life to the next life, but we'll simply step into the next dimension, the next life, and continue the same duties and acts of service that we are doing now. Just as we pray and worship now, so will we then. Just as we seek his will now, so will we then. Just as we place our lives around the service of others now, so will we then. Just as we hunger and thirst after righteousness now, so shall we then. Just as our minds are consumed by the knowledge of him and the great God he is and the joy it brings us in serving him now, so shall it then, friends. And so our duty here truly is to become so heavenly minded that we appear to be no earthly good because we are so distanced from this world now that in our spirits, We are already home. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom is here. It is among you now. And so live faithfully unto the kingdom each and every day. And when you finally arrive in the kingdom, the only difference will be that all you envision in your soul now will become an actual reality. Friends, I pray that I haven't confused you. I pray that you know what I am saying is true, that the spirit of the living God has quickened this in your mind, and that this will not only motivate you, but it will charge you to live more faithfully before Yahweh, your God, Jesus, your King, as you walk in his spirit each and every moment of your life. Well, I love you, friends. I truly love you. And I pray that these will be words of hope and encouragement exhortation in your service unto your king. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, as I said, I do love you. I'll see you on the next video.